time to expose the softer side of Linux for great gaming, today on Call for Help. I hope these people can help me with my computer. Oh. <gasps> Technician will be with you in four hours. Four hours? You can upgrade for just five thousand dollars. What? The Universal Serial Config Board should be set to ID six. I need that in plain English. Help! Leo Laporte to call for help. May I help you? Hello, how are you? Welcome to Call for Help, the show where we help you get the most out of your personal computer. <laughs> I'm Leo Laporte, and it's so good to have you today. Got a great show for you, but first, let me introduce my call for help team. <laughs> Uh, on your left, Amber MacArthur. Hi, Leo. That's good to see you today. Good to see you, too. Yeah. That's and great and green. Great and green. <laughs> green. That's green, right? Green is right? the new fall color. Uh, <laughs> green is the new black. Yeah. And Andy Walker, who's wearing black, which is the old black. <laughs> yeah. And me, too. I'm all in black. I'm the man in black. Think of me as Johnny Cash. <laughs> so how are you today? Great. Really, Did you really guys good. do a little run last night? Yeah. yeah. A little one, yeah. so depressing. It's so, you guys are so No, fit. it's so good. It's, it's so great. beautiful down here by the water, too. Mm. Toronto, you know. It's crisp fall weather. It's Springy, really? uh, fall, springy, uh, it's fall like. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, nice, it's really, it? really nice. So you run down the waterfront. Yeah, yeah. yeah and, you yeah. know, the sun's low in the sky after the show, so shining right know. in your eyes. And by all the boats. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's really pretty. That's great. Oh, well, yeah. you know, I'll, I'll wave at you as I drive by my limit. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> so, uh, what do you have on the show for us today, Amber? Um, I'm actually going to be talking about linking in the web workshop segment mm -hmm. today. Mm -hmm. So that'll be kind of exciting. Linking. Yeah, linking. linking How to, to link others? well. How yeah. to link well. How to link well. And influence people. Yeah, influence people. Yeah. Okay. Good. And Andy, you have anything frozen or uh, no? Not setting anything on fire. Or nothing on fire. Today, no. Nothing to hit with a hammer. <laughs> what do you be doing today? Uh, Windows processes. You know all the nuts and bolts of Windows and behind the scenes. The so key. when you press Control Alt Delete, yeah. you see all those things oh, in that long great. list. Yeah. What that yeah. means. What the heck those are. You know. Good. So, yeah. That'll be fun. And of that's course, we're gonna have lots of good calls today. I know. Our free file today too is gonna be kind of fun, but I won't tell you anything about that. Yeah. I'll just say we'll get snap happy. Snap happy. Snap happy. Yeah. Who's our first caller of the day? All right, so we have our first caller on the line. It's Alan from Windsor, Ontario. Mm, neck cam or phone? It's neck, neck cam. cam? Yeah. Oh, I love it when we get a neck cam. Because then we can see him. And let's say, speaking of seeing people, hello to Basil. Our coconut rum man for the day. Yes. <laughs> we'll be mixing uh, do a little mixology a little later on. Hey Alan, how are you? Welcome to the show. How you doing? It's great to see you. How are things today? Good, very good. Yeah. yeah. Like your show, it's really good. Oh, hey, thanks for watching. We appreciate it. It's we're doing the best we can with our limited abilities. That's all we anybody <laughs> could say. What can I do for you today? Um, whenever I uh, go into my options for my power options, yeah. I uh, set it to my name and I apply and I hit OK mm -hmm. and everything works great. But when I restart the computer, it always goes back to the default options. So you're talking about in Windows XP. Right. And the uh, control panel, it says power options. Yes. And you've got your own little power scheme that's all yours. Yeah, I just put my name on it. And right. So nothing shuts off. Right. Never, never, never. Look, we do the same thing. This is our studio options, because obviously when we're doing a TV show, we don't want the system to go to sleep. Um, yeah, I, I, I do the same thing. Now, it can happen. Normally, it saves them. By the way, this is, this is uh, you know, every time we reboot, it comes back this way. This is our option. But sometimes the registry where it's stored, uh, registry editor where it's stored can get damaged. And if, if that happens, you'll have exactly the symptom you're having, uh, Alan, which is that it won't uh, remember it from boot to boot. So the fix is to actually use regedit. Have you ever used regedit? Um, no. Well, how exciting. You're a regedit virgin. <laughs> oh, dear. Well, there's nothing to be afraid of. You know, usually when you read about using regedit, uh, let me just explain, first of all, what the registry is. It is a, a actually more than one file. It's a couple of files that Windows keeps all of its settings in. Now, it's not a text file, as in older versions of Windows. In the old days, you could edit WinAny and, uh, and uh, System.Any and, you know, change how the system worked. Nowadays, you've got to go in here into a binary file. So, uh, at least my Microsoft provides you with this uh, simple editor to allow you to modify these uh, data uh, points in here. There are uh, third-party registry editors that are even more powerful, but this one's just fine. We're going to actually change the, or, or eliminate the, uh, anything but the basic power settings. If a, this happens from time to time, a power setting gets damaged, it won't remember it, and it'll revert back to a standard power setting. So I'm going to go to H key, current user, 
And that you'll see in the registry editor. Now, people will give you all these warnings about using the register, registry editor. I, I, don't worry too much about the registry editor. Just don't mess around with stuff you don't understand. It would be the, the main point that I would make, okay? And also uh, set a system restore point before you get you in You could there. do that, or you could even back it up. I mean, it's not, it's, it's not, a, it's not a big issue. So we're going to go into, because uh, the truth is, unless you really kind of muck around with it, you're not going to damage anything. We're going to go to H key current user control panel power config and then to power policies. Now zero through five are the default power policies and you'll see in fact as I click on it if you look up here in the upper right you could see the, you'll recognize these home office desk portable laptop presentation these are all of the standard ones that come with Windows. When you get to anything above five then you're going to see some non-standard ones. You'll have a couple of non-standard in your system. What I want you to do uh, Alan is delete them. Okay. okay, so just you, you click on six, seven, eight, nine, however many you have. You press the delete key and say, "You sure you want to delete this?" If you wanted to be overzealous and protect, you know, protect yourself, you could export this key before you delete it and save it. It'll just save it as a text file, which you could re-import to restore things to the way they were. I don't think you need to do that. These are not. Just don't delete anything lower than five. That's all. So that zero through five is going to be there, and then close it. Now, what that's going to do is that's going to delete all the custom settings you did recreate those and I'll do that right now and this time it should remember them it's just you know it's a it's a well-known little flaw in the way Windows XP works that's all so I'm gonna say like you never turn off the monitor never turn off the hard drives never turn uh, never go into standby and then I'm gonna save this as call for help studio that'll recreate the key in the registry and this time it should remember it if it doesn't repeat the process until it does Okay? Okay, thank you. Pretty simple. Registry editing is uh, often the answer to a lot of these kind of weirdo wind Windows things. You see now it's added uh, this special Call for Help Studio one that's going to be part of my registry from now on. There are often uh, the ways that you fix things. It can be a little scary, but the main thing is don't go messing around with stuff you don't know what you're doing. Just go to the spot that people tell you to go and make those modifications, simple modifications. And if you want to, as Andy said, set a system restore point beforehand. That'll always give you the chance to go back. Thanks for the call, Alan. Okay, thank you. I appreciate it. Okay. Yeah, this is a this is a, a common problem, and this the, the fix is actually fairly fairly simple. Coming up, if you've ever hit Control Alt Delete and looked at that long list of processes in the Windows Task Manager, just goes on and on and on. We're going to show you what they mean. Background processes demystified with Andy Walker in just a bit. Stay right. Here. Often uh, times we'll recommend, or somebody will recommend, you hit Control, the Alt, Delete, the three-fingered salute. In the old versions of Windows, it would reboot the machine. In the new version of Windows XP, it shows you what's going on behind the scenes. And he's going to hit Control, Alt, Delete for us and explain what those mystifying Windows processes are. I absolutely am, um, and it's quite fascinating once you get into sort of the the language that Microsoft mm -hmm. has invented for this. But <laughs> let's get straight to it because it's uh, one of those things that people wonder about. And yeah, I'm kind of yeah. mystify it. Can you um, show us a Control? Alt delete just so we can see what we're talking about. Yeah, here. yeah. Poise your fingers. <laughs> <laughs> Control Alt delete. Alt delete. And there is a now that normally the Applications tab comes up, but if you click the Processes tab, you'll see this. That's right. And uh, actually, let's just uh, you can actually click the different uh, topics up top here. Just to, I like to click the image name so it's in alphabetical order. Okay. But so within this, you will see a different listing for everything that's running on the computer at any given time. And every computer is going to be a little bit different. It will. Yeah. With except, with, except that they all have some commonalities because right. there's about a dozen or so standard Windows processes that work. Right. Um, and you'll see actually uh, under, the, under the username it says uh, you know either system or the user that's actually using them. So that column, that second column there is right. who is running that process. That's right. And in many cases it's, this, it's, it's Windows itself. That's what it says, system. The system. So some of the more standard ones are, you know, CR, CSRSS. That creates a, uh, a process. Uh, CSRSS. Yeah, it's right. kind of goofy. <laughs> uh, and, you know, and of course, these are, they don't need to be cryptic, but they are, and I don't know why. Um, well, geeks like to be cryptic, I guess. <laughs> right. One of the famous ones is the is LSAS. LSAS. But EXE. Now that's actually that manages security on Windows, mm -hmm. um, but there was a virus. Uh, called Sasser. Sasser virus, right? But that was actually it ran out as a process. L S A S. One less S. One less S. So you know, you know, for the untrained eye, you Looked know, the same. It looks the same. 
you'll, you'll see things like services, you know, sort of the fundamental, you know, the, the, the inside of Windows kind of keeping things running there. You have service host. A good little trick, actually, there's lots of service host listings. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to show you, if, if you click on your start button, click on run, and type task list slash SRV. Actually, no, I've got to go to command first, excuse me, before I do that. Let's get rid of this. So you run a command window. So run, a, so run CM, and then CMD, CMD. and you're going to type task list slash S R V. The reason you open a command window is this will go scrolling by if you don't, and, and you won't ever get to read it. In a command window, you at least can go and look at the old, the, what's, what's scrolled by. Right. These are all the services running. So you can actually see the service host is, is basically, it's like a closet with boxes in it. Which right. boxes are oh, in it? There's all the services. It's all the different services that are running okay. in there. Anyway, but you know, you're not going to remember all this, and I don't frankly remember all of them right. at all. So I, this is a website I found called processlibrary.com. A process library, basically, all you do is you enter in the name of the, uh, of the process, and it will actually give you a sense of what exactly it's supposed to, whether Very it's supposed to be handy. there. Very handy. Very handy. So there, you know, LSAS is a local security authority service, but if I type in LSA, oops, LSAS, One which S. is, let's search now. Oh, oh. It, it, maybe because you did EXE? Could be. LSAS. Search now. No, they didn't find it. Well, that's, that's too bad. But anyway. The, <laughs> so much for that. So much for that. They do, uh, they, these guys, a company called UniBlue that publishes this website, they do a program called Windows, um, oops, hang on. They call it WinTasks, which actually gives you a lot more detail about. That's really neat, too, because I, I don't know. Maybe it's just me, but I like to find this stuff out. I, yeah. I, Maybe that Amber and I were talking about. We, we, this is something Amber would have couldn't care less about, and, mo, no. and she says most women couldn't care less about. And a lot of geeky guys go, "Oh, wow, what is that though? What is that though?" <laughs> There's two different kinds of people in the world. People yeah. who care no, what the right. process means, and people who couldn't care yeah, less. Yeah, exactly. I like Control Alt Delete just to turn things off and get rid of them right. so right. it stops running. But that's as far as well, I. Well, and that go. would be your practical approach because if yeah. you if you could go to Process Library and figure out, oh, this is spyware, or yeah. this is a virus, go in there, find the listing, go click. And you know, get rid of it get until rid you can deal it. with it. So she okay. doesn't care. <laughs> <laughs> I'm learning it. to care more and more, but I think that it's another step. <laughs> no, you know, it'll be a while till you shouldn't care. Yeah. I think that's great. I mean, that's the difference. That's the difference. You know, and and I, I shouldn't say boys and girls because it isn't fair to say that. Yeah. Some people are interested in this stuff. Some people aren't. And this show. We want to serve all of you. So yeah. for those of you who want to know what's under the hood, mm -hmm. that's it. That's so it. the program is called, uh, called Wintasks. Winta yeah, Wintasks. But you can also go on their website and do it for free. Yeah. In fact, if you go to processlibrary.com, they actually have a listing for Wintasks as well if you right. want to download it. Very right. cool. That's really fun. And, and it actually is important for security. If, you know, often you'll get an email saying, watch out, this thing. You, now you can find out. You can verify. Is this a problem or is it not a problem? Yeah. I like it. Mm. For more information on, uh, on processes and how to know what's going on in your system, go to callforhelptv.com and check the show notes. We'll be back in just a gif. But first, let's get our quiz question of the day here so you can start thinking about it. HPFS, that was created for which operating system? I'll give you a hint. It stands for High Performance File System. Is it for Longhorn, Linux, OS2, or Carly Fiorina's dishwasher? She's got a very fancy dishwasher. <laughs> CEO of HP. <laughs> now, see, she cares about the process. Get to the Windows or, or the website and give us the answer. We'll talk about it in a little bit. It's Call for Help continues. Welcome back to Call for Help. Not magic, I told you to be right back. And for my next trick, ladies and gentlemen, I'll be solving yet another one of your computer riddles, I hope. Amber! Yep. Amber, my assistant. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Who do we have? We have Randy from London, Ontario on the line. Can we saw you in half later in the show, Amber? Uh, no. No, okay. Because <laughs> I don't know how to do that. Okay, and that's good. Be a mess. Hi, Randy, welcome to the show. Hi, Leo. Good to have you. Thank you. What can I do for you today? Well, um, I have, uh, I bought my wife a, a tungsten tea uh, late last year. Oh, aren't you a nice person? Yeah, I know. And, and it's got this Bluetooth technology in it. Right. And I just wondered how I can use that Bluetooth to, to uh, connect to the Internet or uh, use it for email. Now, does it, did the tea, tungsten you got her have uh, Wi-Fi as well in it? Or just Bluetooth? Just Bluetooth. Okay. Yeah, Wi-Fi is generally the more common way to get uh, those things online. Right. Um, but you can actually, I mean, there's a couple of ways you can do it. If you had a Bluetooth phone, 
uh, or a Bluetooth computer, you can often use its internet connection to get online. But believe it or not, I was kind of surprised to find this out. People do make Bluetooth access points. Oh. Now, Bluetooth is was never designed really, for, or I don't think it was designed for networking. It was more designed to replace tech cables in areas like uh, connecting a cell phone uh, or a PDA to a computer or a keyboard or a mouse to a computer, that kind of thing. Because right. uh, it's only 10 meters. Uh, it uses the uh, same uh, frequency as Wi-Fi, 2.4 gigahertz, but its bandwidth is a lot less. I mean, we're talking between 400 and 700 kilobits a second. So it's not as fast as your uh, high-speed Internet access in many cases, but it's fast enough to surf, and certainly on a, on a PDA it would probably be fast enough. Right. So one way you can go, these are not cheap, but one way you can go is a Bluetooth access point. This is one from Belkin for $200. Uh, PicoNet also makes one. There are a couple of companies. This is probably the PicoNet that's relabeled by Belkin. Um, so this is, uh, and now they claim a 100 meter range on this one. So they, uh, this one uh, obviously boosts it uh, more than, the reason Bluetooth is so low range is because these devices are mostly cell phones. And of course, you're not going to want to put a big, powerful cell phone uh, thing in there. So, the, right. so, the, so there's a 10 meter adapter and a 100 meter adapter. Uh, it comes at 723 kilobits per second. So if you wanted to make it possible for her to use that tungsten, if you're a really nice husband, and you want to make it possible for her to use that tungsten in the house as a, a uh, as a Wi-Fi type device, an internet networking device, this is what you would do. Uh, otherwise, if she's on the road, you know, if, you, if you're in a Starbucks, you know, they're not going to offer Bluetooth. They're going to offer Wi-Fi. Sure. So it's probably not going to help her. I don't know of any converter that would take a Wi-Fi signal. And that would be a good product and turn it into a Bluetooth signal that would then go into your PDA. I don't think anybody makes anything like that. Right. But there's a, you know, believe it or not, you can actually, there is, I was really surprised to find this out. There are Bluetooth access points. Mm. So is this for the house or you mean while she's wandering around on the road? No, it's, it's just for the house. Yeah, well, this would do it. Great. Cost almost as much as a tungsten. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> hey, thanks for the call. Thanks, Leo. It's your, an absolute pleasure, pleasure listening to you and hey, talking to you. Well, thank you. It's a pleasure to talk to you. What's your wife's name? Tina. She's very lucky. <laughs> what did you get? Well, you got her a tungsten, so I know you got yourself something. <laughs> What'd you get? No, not, 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 not that time. I didn't get anything for myself at all. <laughs> wow, Randy. You must have been in the doghouse, or you're just a good darn husband. <laughs> That's really nice. All right, we'll see you later, and thank, okay. thank you for calling. Thanks, Leo. I appreciate it. And Tina's right. luck, one lucky person. Hey, we talked about screen capture capture programs the, uh, the other day. There are all sorts of different screen capture programs out there. Andy, of course, found us one that had like 8,000 features. Amber has one. <laughs> this is a perfect example <laughs> that just gets the job done. It's very easy to use. Another free file of the day. But yeah. that's a good point. Yeah, you know, it no, doesn't have really to simple. be complicated if all you want is screen Exactly. Capture. Even the name is easier. Hover Snap. Hover Snap. I <laughs> easier like the than Gadwin Print Screen. <laughs> yeah. 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 But that, I, I just, now maybe I've been going on and on about this, but I just really, I think it's very interesting. Yeah. It's like I just figured this out, right? There is a <laughs> difference between not just men and women but between different kinds of users some yeah. users are really more focused on functionality yeah and they care more about it and I think there's some yeah. people who don't care as much they just want it to work get it done and I'm one of those people <laughs> great let's see it all right so hover I, snap hover snap so I'm actually taking a picture here of Jacob Nielsen your you hero know, I'm a big fan of Jacob Nielsen We've got to get him on the show yes it would be great and I'm doing web workshops later today he's so. the king of web usability yeah That's he's great yeah. so we'll have a picture of him and what we do is we open it up and then we go to hover snap Snap. Okay. And as you can see, this little window is very user-friendly, mm -hmm. really simple to use. Um, and we have also, there's an FTP upload feature in this. Oh, really Andy didn't cool. have that. Oh, yeah. now yum, we're getting yum. fancy. That's really cool. So for anyone who wants to upload wow. pictures to their to site. Website. Yeah, to the website. You know what? I'm going to download that because yeah. I do that all the time. It's really, really handy. If you're just taking, you know, you're showing someone a site and they say, oh, can you send me a picture mm. of that? So it's a really easy way to, you know, upload it to your site and include it there. So um, we'll just take a little snapshot of him. And we now, can... You have to open this up every time you're going to. It do actually it. sits right down in the menu oh, okay. bar at the Good bottom, line. and it's a little, so it's a little tiny camera, so that's <laughs> handy as well. Like Easy to see. All right, so we'll call him Jacob Live. Yeah. That'll be the name of our picture. All right. And then we'll quit this. All right. Now all you have to do is what? Press the print screen button. You actually, yeah. Just hold on. So it modifies print screen just as uh, uh, the Gadwin did. Yep. Print exactly. screen will just copy to the clipboard without these additional. Yeah. Layers. So this is handy if anyone wants to include images in a document or something like that. Um, so we print it and then we open up our file and it saves into the hover snap file folder wherever you want to save. It can save in a different place. 
And then we there's, have the capture. There's Jacob. Oh, here's a different one. Oh, oh that was one oh. I probably did earlier. That's yeah, right. that's one you I did earlier. Idea. Yeah, you get the idea, though. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's a couple of them. So you can change the names of them. And yeah, there's another picture of Jacob. This program is so cool, it takes a guy's jacket off. Yeah. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> now that's It gives him a whole new wardrobe. I need this, actually. <laughs> Women will love this now. <laughs> Jacob, you've been stalked, Jacob. <laughs> yeah, exactly. This is his book. We'll give him a little plug later on yeah. when we do the web workshop. Yeah, we're going to talk about linking later on. Yeah. So. yeah so Hover Snap. Yeah, so it's a great little uh, file. I like it. And it's free. Free file. It's free, yeah. Thank you so much, Amber. Coming up after this short commercial message, yeah. Our Linux guru is here, Marcel Gagne, and he's got game. Linux games. Yeah, Linux just games. A bit. Stay right here. Back to call for help. <laughs> the Linux operating system is a great tool for engineers and scientists, but it doesn't have to be such a serious tool either. We can play some games. Marcel Gagne, our resident li Linux expert, is uh, <laughs> here to show us how Linux became uh, as a, uses a gaming platform. Marcel, of course, is the author of Cooking with Linux in the Linux Journal. That is correct. And your new book is? My new book is Moving to the Linux Business Desktop. It's sitting over there on the shelf. Wait a minute, let me get us. it from the bookshelf. Dear God. Somebody put it in our bookshelf. Marcel oh, it's on your said, bookshelf. Marcel said you can't have it, so I'm going <laughs> to <laughs> so we're going to have to give it back to him. It's but my only copy right now. <laughs> this just, I mean, literally. Just literally just, came, just out. came out. I mean, this is like so hot. It so you have, you have moving the Linux desktop for regular users, and now this is for the that's business right. user. That's yeah, right. Business-oriented type stuff. And that's published by Addison Wesley. It is indeed. And he, of course, the picture of him with the, 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 the chef's hat, which is, we did on the last I time. I know. I know. You don't have to bring it every time. <laughs> I think a lot of people do think Linux, think of Linux as a very serious uh, operating system or perhaps as uh, more of a server operating system, but every Linux distro comes with games. Piles of games, Shows. in fact. Actually, it's interesting. I run an online Linux user group called mm -hmm. the Wolf to Lug, and I actually said, what would you like me to talk about on the show? And, oh, good. You know, and a bunch of people said, actually, a bunch of people came back and said, well, you know, nobody seems to know there are games here. Show oh, them something games. about games. So. The kind of addictive games like Tetris and Skokoban that you just can't stop playing yeah, which And they sound really simple, but so exactly. Exactly, extremely addictive yeah. stuff. So, like the average Linux distribution, if you click on the with you know the big K in the corner, right. or you know the start button, whatever you want to call it, right. there are a whole pile of games that come preloaded with the system. I mean, we've got a whole bunch of arcade games, um, board games, all free, card games, all free, and they come pre-installed. And they're you know uh, some kids games, tactics, strategy type games, some arcade games, and then even we've even got uh, things what they call edutainment, which are you know um, oh, educational a, a games for kids. Type Typing tutor, vocabulary yeah. training. All sorts that's of things, great. you know, uh, more geared, obviously, to the younger people in the oh, family. They got so they logo. Got something to play with. My daughter wants to have a logo on the computer. I'll just uh, set up the Linux computer. Absolutely. With logo. logo. K Turtle. She's learning logo. Yeah. Isn't that neat? That's, that's, that's a great the... way for kids to start learning I programming. Agree. Yeah, she loves it. So oh, well, here's some games. Hey, why don't I start with something real simple then? Okay. You know, I'll start with the potato guy. This is like Mr. Potato Head. This only. is Mr. Hasbro potato Head. Hasbro has sanctioned it, so they can't call it. Oh, okay. Sorry. All right. In that case, then it's not Mr. Potato Head, it's the potato guy. Tuberling or something oh, like that. that. And of course we can throw things like hats on them. I'm not going to sit there and go through it. But they've got playgrounds here where they've got different things. You know, you've got an aquarium where you can stick Ooh. fish in there. See, this is for little kids, but they love this kind of stuff. Yeah, it's just fun. Yeah. Um, how, how old is your uh, baby? Uh, 11 weeks old. Not going to be playing this quite yet. Hi, Sebastian. I just <laughs> want to say hi. Any minute now, Sebastian will say, <laughs> Dad, where's the potato guy? Okay, That's what right. else do we got? Now, you, there are also some more serious, like, arcade games. Right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, you mentioned Tetris-like games and yep. so forth. Probably I one love of the those puzzle games. One of the most addictive games in the entire universe is this one here. And uh, this is something called Frozen Bubble. And it, the it like oh, no, it's like a breakout kind of Yeah, Tetris. it's like a breakout sort of Tetris uh, where you sit there and you basically throw these. And this thing oh. keeps coming down as you go along. It is incredibly, horribly, oh, viciously I know this addictive. Game. It was called uh, uh, Blocks. Patrick Norton started playing this in the screensavers, and we lost him for a few weeks. Oh, this is awful. In he fact, I'm going to stop it right yeah, now. now. Yeah, now. Stop now. <laughs> stop now. That's fun. That's it really is. fun. It's yeah. great fun. And, What's it um, called in the arcade? Bust a move, okay. Bust a move, is that what it's called? Was that Greg, our sound guy, was telling me that? All right. Do you remember Tron? Isn't that? Okay. Tron, I love Tron. Remember Tron? Tron? Yeah. Okay, there's this game here called GL Tron. This is an open GL game, so it there requires a, a 3D accelerated video card to play this thing. But, but I, you have, your laptop's good enough, apparently. Well, my laptop has got one of those really cheesy accelerated video cards, which That's is good actually. Enough. Whoa! Whoa! Ah! Oh! Oh! 
Jeff Bridges would be so mad right now. <laughs> oh, how fun. And oh, this one is actually networked as well, so you can go on the internet and play with that other players really and so cool. forth. Oh, that would be really you know, cool. And actually, a lot of these games are like that. Um, I, met, I showed you the board games. Like, right. I've got Battleship and Monopoly and things like you that. You against other people. And I, I've played, uh, sorry, not Monopoly, but I've played Battleship against a friend of mine's <laughs> kids at home. Oh, what fun. I don't cut them any slack. I sink everything <laughs> they've got. Sebastian's going to have so much fun. I don't care how old they What's are. What's the state of, like, commercial games? I mean, can we get Diablo or Unreal Tournament, that kind of thing? Um, some of the games have been ported so they'll run natively under Linux. Right. So some of those do exist. I believe Unreal Tournament 2004 is okay. one of the ones that have Doom, done that. Doom, of course, was very early. Yes. Yeah. Um, I think Halo 2. Civilization. I'm, I mean, I'm not 100% sure. A yes. few games, yeah, but not all of them. By no, means. no. Uh, but there are, there's starting to be an increasing number of them, of the commercial games. But right. if you're doing commercial gaming stuff, there is another way. And one of the ways to do it is um, there's something called Hawaiian X, which is now called Codega, I think is the name of the company now. And uh, what it is, is it's a, um, it uses the Wine emulation engine for Windows. So you can actually run those um, you know, high graphics Windows games on Linux without having to run Windows. Wow. So you go it does out, you all right? I mean, they look all right? They look fine. They look really? great, actually. Gosh, I'm yeah. surprised. Now, it doesn't do all of them. It's tweaked for some of the more yeah. popular ones and so right. forth. You know, but if you absolutely must play Grand Theft Auto or something like that, <laughs> you can. That's cool. <laughs> you know? That's so cool. it actually does work very, very nicely that way. We'll have a... Why don't you come back and talk a little bit about Wine and Codega and uh, and how Windows applications can be played, sure. uh, ported over to Linux. Uh, we should do that. Linux. So that. That's probably the last piece of the puzzle for people who have Windows programs they have to run. And so they say, I can't abandon Windows. I've got to run these programs. Yeah, it's like I desperately must have those things. Right. And there are other ways to do that as well. And maybe we can cover that in okay, another good. episode as That'd well. That'd be fun. I'd like mm -hmm. to do that. Marcel mm -hmm. Gagne is the cook, the chief cook and bottle washer at the Linux Journal. Of course, the Cooking with Linux is his column, and I love it. That's and these right. Are the new books. And you must see these books. They're so good. I think your your computer's ringing. Are you expecting a phone call on your computer? I am not expecting a phone <laughs> Moving call. Moving to the Linux this is business call for desktop. Help, isn't it, though? That's pretty funny. <laughs> it must be one of the games is calling you. Yes. Uh, Marcel Gagné, the author, and Addison Wesley, the publisher. Marcel, it's so great to have you. Come back and talk more about Linux. This today. ball's of fun. It's, it's great. great. I'm not, I want to go play with some <laughs> mics. Go. I didn't realize how many good games. There we'll are be tons back of games. In, free. We'll be back in just a bit. And if eight bits equals a byte, well, hmm, one bit means we'll see you soon, I guess. Four bits is a nibble. Eight times. Four bits is a nibble. And yeah. Stay right here. We'll be okay. back in a bit. Or two. Or End of line. End of line. Ah, I see you have the machine that goes ding. Welcome back to Call for Help. Leo Laporte here. We, I think we've lost Amber. Amber and Marcel. Uh -huh. what are, you are you showing her a game, Marcel? Yeah, I'm showing her how to play a free droid RPG. Uh, we're about to collect up some armor, and we, we need to chat with uh, Francis, who's the researcher <laughs> very here, cool. to find out uh, where can I get a weapon, because uh, we need to save the universe. Yes. So. Cool. Another you've free Linux game. You've, yeah. You've lost me. <laughs> do, you ever, do you ever play games, Amber? Do you ever do Not that? really, you know. I think I'm worried about getting into gaming, because it'll yeah. take so much time. Yeah. She will now, though. We're yeah. going to get her totally. I know. This is very cool. You can't stop playing. I know. Apparently, there's an arms dealer in town where you can, you know, if you've got oh, some, boy. you can get some money there and you can spend it on some weapons. So just it looks a little bit, uh, maybe a little bit like uh, like uh, Diablo or, uh, or one of those games. So you're wandering around, you're meeting yeah, people. Yeah, you're wandering around, and every once in a while, like, you know, I can, uh, you know, thanks for the help, I'll be going now. You go back to the screen, and then uh, you go out there with your lightsaber and you kill people, and uh, or actually, in this case, you killed robots. Can you go which, back to the, can you uh, stop talking to him and go back to the... Um, the area? Because I'd like yep. to, yeah, yeah. So we go back to the area, and, and I can just move them around and so that. forth, and there are things that you can open up, you know, there's a chest there, and inside the chest, uh, that's fun. medium health capsule, yeah. capsules. Yeah, don't take. get don't get into these, Amber, because they... I know, I'm totally are, distracted. This is exactly the kind of thing you'll never stop playing. It's totally addictive. I'm uh, no kidding. <laughs> hey, we do have another call. Is there, uh, you have somebody on the line for Oh, us? yeah, oh, yeah, sorry. yeah, sorry. <laughs> we have Alan from Brantford, Ontario on that's the line. Right. You can go back to playing your game. Thanks, Leah. Hey, Alan, how are you? Not too bad. How are you doing, Leo? Uh, we're doing great, and we appreciate I know you're at work right now, so we appreciate your uh, taking some time. I hope the boss doesn't mind. Uh, what he doesn't know won't hurt him. Ah, we won't mention it then. We don't great. say where you work. What can I do for you, Alan? Well, I had a question specifically about uh, MP3 players and yes. the SD RAM that um, you can use to augment right. their memory. Right. Now, my son had bought an MP3 player, and he bought... Um, when he went to buy the SD RAM, mm -hmm. the salesman um, told him that there's two different types. There's sort of the name brands that are at X dollars, and then there's the 
no-name brands that were at about half the price. Right. And he explained that the difference between the two was that the no-name brands wouldn't last as long. <laughs> they weren't rated for as many uh, transfers of uh, information. Right. In theory, there is a limit. Um, if you look at the, what they call the mean time between failure, which is how you rate disks and devices that you read and write to, the mean time between failure on most flash devices is about one million hours. One million. One million. I don't know how many days that is, but it's a lot. Um, and there is, I think, a theoretical limit in the number of times you can read and write flash RAM, but it's such a high number, like 100,000 times, that even the cheap stuff, I don't think you'd wear out. You'd have to write to it every few seconds for years to wear it out. So, okay. so I don't think that that's going to be an issue at all. He can get the cheap stuff. The biggest difference I found between the cheap and more expensive stuff tends to be the speed. Um, now, that's not so much true in SD because it doesn't, it's, it's, it's a little different. But in compact flash, you can see a big difference in speed between the high-priced compact flash and the and less expensive compact flash. But they'll usually say that this is 40X or 80X. This is high-speed compact flash. SD, I don't think it makes any difference. Get the cheap stuff. Okay. Right. Now, if, um, just to sort of supplement that question a little bit, yeah. if I wanted to have a format for storing, um, like archiving uh, information or pictures, right. would uh, CD-ROMs or DVD-ROMs, do they um, also last for yes. as long? Or? Uh, in fact, I think they're a very good choice. Uh, here's the, you know, for a while there was some uh, speculation that maybe they wouldn't last that long. There were a couple of things that led to that. In the early days of manufacturing CDs, they didn't get the um, seal very good between the polycarbonate layers. And uh, moisture and mold and things were getting in and eating the reflective layer. And so there, would, there was something called uh, a, a CD rot, where you would, uh, or bit rot, or data rot, where the actual CD would start to rust away or oxidize away. And yeah, you'd lose the data. That's years ago. They've gotten very good about sealing that. So that doesn't a pro isn't a problem anymore. And then there was a German magazine uh, last year that took some CDs a couple of years ago, put them away in a dark, cool place. Two years later, take them out. And, and, and lo and behold, about half of them had lost all their data. And that set up a real stir in the, uh, in the business. Because everybody was thinking, oh my gosh, we thought these would last 100 years. I have checked with Andy McFadden, who's the author of the CD Recordable FAQ, which is a really great, uh, highly recommended site. Let's use a Firefox. Uh, highly recommended. F I never like to use Explorer if I can avoid it. CDRFAQ, uh, just to get his, uh, it's uh, CDRFAQ.org. And he told me, no, don't worry about it. These things are going to last uh, at least several decades, probably more like 100 years. And the issue is really not whether the CD or the DVD is going to last. Uh, let me see if I can find the uh, article on longevity. The issue is, what will you use to play it 50 years from now? <laughs> because are you going to have a CD player 50 years from now? No, that's a good point. Probably not, right? So that's the, that's the bigger issue. Um, uh, the, I think the media is going to outlast the player. Uh, you know, I have, for instance, uh, on my um, uh, camcorder, I recorded a lot of high 8 tapes of my child being born and things like that. And all of a sudden, I realize I've got these tapes. The tapes are probably in good condition, but what am I going to play them back on? Uh, and that's going to be more. And that was only a few years ago, so that's going to be more of the issue. I think what you're going to want to do probably is back these uh, CDs and uh, DVDs up periodically and be very alert and vigilant. And when we move to a new format, the next one out, by the way, is going to be high definition DVD. Uh, then move them to the new format so that you're always kind of you know, keeping up with the, uh, with the burning. No, that sounds like a great idea. Yeah. 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 Andy, do you want to say something? Oh, it's just, it just makes me laugh. I mean, you think about, go back to all the different formats, 8-track, even you know, yeah. LP records. And, yeah. I mean, God knows if, if those are going away in 20 years, I mean, CD is going to be Forget 100 years. Yeah. And, and just think of all the people who have jazz disks and zip disks. They're in the closet, hundreds of megabytes worth of files, yeah. probably cannot be read, not because the disc is bad, but because who has a zip player these days, you know? Yeah. Who has a jazz player these days? So if, the most important thing, Alan, is to just keep on, keep on these things and transfer the most valuable stuff to uh, the new medium as time goes by, you know? That's going to be absolutely the most important thing. I and mean, it's going to be terabyte drives in the house before absolutely. long. Absolutely. Now, the good numbers. news is they're digital. It's, we don't, you know, we're no longer transferring from analog to digital. So the transfer will be quick, it'll be easy, it'll be painless, and it won't degrade the quality at all. You've done the most important thing, which is get them 
into bits. Once they're bits, now we can copy them infinitely and, and transmit them in all sorts of ways. I, you know, who knows? What, you know, if we're still doing this show 10 years from now, who knows what we'll be talking about? You know, great data stores in the sky. I don't know where we'll be sending our stuff. I, am, I wouldn't be surprised to see, uh, because of high-speed Internet connectivity, the inexpensiveness of uh, storage, I wouldn't be surprised to see every buddy have a terabyte of offline storage, some centralized server downtown that you upload your stuff to and they keep track of it and they store it and they keep it safe. I wouldn't be surprised to see that at all. Uh, I, was, it, I went to the Almaden Labs in San Jose, uh, the IBM, IBM Labs, IBM yeah. Labs yeah. and they were talking about a yottabyte of data I in mean, a sugar cube. Now, yottabyte is, yottabyte is more zeros on the end of that number than you can imagine. <laughs> well, you got, well, we've got gigabyte. We're now moving to terabyte, which gigabyte, of course, is billion. Terabyte is a trillion. There is Petabyte, petabyte yeah. which is, uh, is that, is that, uh, what's a, what's a, tr what's trillion plus another times a thousand? I don't know. Lots. And then there's uh, yottabyte and exabyte. Exabyte. And, <laughs> and, and, you know, the truth is that's where we're headed. Yeah. So, yeah, I wouldn't worry about back. I would back yourself up right now to CDR, use high quality media, store it in a cool, dry, dark place. It's going to last, uh, outlast the CD player. All right. Well, thank you very much, Leo. I really thank, appreciate thank your you help. Thank you for the call, Alan. I love, I love the question. It's very important. It's We've got to pay attention to that kind of stuff. Now, I think there is a theoretical limit to the number of times you can write to, see, to flash RAM, but I don't think we've really seen that anyway. No. You will get a gold star, my friends, if you can answer today's quiz question of the day. You ready for it? HPFS, the High Performance File System, was created for which operating system? Was it Longhorn, Linux, OS2, or Carly Fiorina's dishwasher. Ah, yes, the HP 3954 dishwasher. <laughs> it crashed every four uh, cycles, but it was fast. We'll be right back with the answer in just a bit. Stay right here. Welcome back to Call for Help. Before the break, we asked you what the HPFS was. It's the file system for OS2, the oldest of those three operating systems. Actually, I don't know. Maybe Linux is older. OS2 was created by IBM, although some say it was created by Microsoft, and then IBM created NT, and then they swapped because there was a, a joint agreement at the time, and they were working together. It was a good operating system. Multi-user, ran Windows, but Microsoft kind of pulled the plug on it. They, they allowed it to support Windows 3.1, but when 95 came out, they said... Nope. nope. <laughs> that was it on uh, OS2. Still used in banks a lot. You still see. <laughs> now, we got the uh, opti uh, exabyte, petabyte. Uh, I'll, later, later on, I'll show you the list of those. But a yottabyte is, septil is uh, one septillion wow. bytes. <laughs> one septillion wow. of bytes. That's, that's a lot of JPEGs. That's a lot of JPEGs, a septillion <laughs> bytes. I don't even know how much that would be. <laughs> hey, if, if, if you've ever been let down by a link, you know, you go online, you click the link, and you get nothing, a 404. Well, you don't want that to happen. We can we can solve yes, that exactly. problem very easily with Amber's web workshop. Yep. Good linking rules. Good linking rules. So today in web workshop, we're going to talk about linking, okay. which is that you can talk a lot about linking, actually. Really? <laughs> yeah, I can, at least. <laughs> um, there's some basic rules that you should try to follow and that some people don't follow. So for um, our little tutorial today, we're actually going to take a site that someone sent in, uh, Grant from Kelowna. Thank you, um, Grant, for submitting yeah, this. Yeah, thank you Oh, yeah, much. yeah, yeah. This was a, a couple of shows ago. Yeah, yeah. He's yeah this is the uh, young, uh, young Life for, uh, Lo for young, young Life Kelowna. Kelowna. Okay. And he cool. wanted us to take a look at his site. Looks and, like they're partying uh, in Kelowna. Yeah, no kidding. It looks like a lot of fun. Um, and he wanted us to give it a little bit of a review. So okay. we're going to take it through the linking test. Good. Um, okay, so what we'll do is we'll start to talk about the basics of linking, and then we'll talk about types of linking. To start out with, um, the basics of linking is that links should be blue for the most part. This is a very yeah. uh, controversial thing. A lot yeah. of websites color the links unusual colors. Yeah. And you know what? I think for beginners, you should keep it blue and keep them underlined and let them the default should be that it turns purple when you click on them so because that's how it's supposed every other site that's how it's supposed to be generic sites exactly and yeah. for you know a lot of um, you know possibly our viewers who are building their own sites keep it really simple and use the basics there's people who are web designers and they might want to get a little more creative mm -hmm. and I think that's okay depending on your audience but right. if it's for you know your friends and families and people who are you know pretty basic users on the internet just keep it simple I Don't like try it because then I look at blue I know I haven't clicked yeah. on that link I look at the purple I say oh, I've been on I've been to that 
website. Exactly. And it's pretty much easier to navigate. It's much, much easier. So just He did to, that, it looks like. He did it, but um, he did it in the navigation at the okay. top. The only thing is some of the different pieces are underlined and some aren't. Calendar and uh, pictures are underlined, so he should try to underline all of let's those Let's get some links. consistency. Okay. Yeah, get some consistency. Now, that's not it built into the browser. Don't I get to choose that as the user, whether it's underlined or not? You can overwrite it, though. Oh, yeah, you can so he's overriding yeah, in some Yeah, I think he's overriding okay. in some cases. Um, and one thing that he did here that he should probably change is when we have a list of upcoming events, my mm -hmm. first reaction Those is are to blue. click on these yeah. because they're blue. So that's another um, example of how it's inherent to click on anything that's blue on the I web. thought they were links, too. So I know. don't make them blue if they're not Yeah, links. just make pick them another black. color. You know, okay. just make them black. Black would okay. definitely work. Okay. Um, Same thing with the red. It looks like I've clicked on that. Yeah, yeah. it looks yeah. like you've clicked on it. So yeah. keep it simple. So if he changed that to a different color, I think it would help a lot on the usability on okay. his home Good. page. Good. So the next thing we're going to talk about is types of links. So there's mm -hmm. three general types of links that people don't really need to know all this I kind of know it because I've been in the business of doing this for a while but there's embedded links right. there's structural links and associative links um, embedded links are those links that are within the content that take you to other parts of the site okay so we're gonna go to um, what is YL and on this page you can see that he doesn't use any linking on this page so what he should try to do is come up with um, some places where you can go from here within so the text within the text so this is a, an example of how someone's taking probably print copy and putting it right. online and they're forgetting to link to other parts where the part of the key part of the web is that you you it's hypertext you exactly. li click around and you, so you expect that yeah you should definitely I mean there's lots of places for example young staff and volunteer leaders well put a link under young staff and volunteer leader, leaders and, and take them to to page. the staff page, right? Ah, so you need okay. to give people, um, let's just close that, you need to give people a reason to continue to go throughout the site and keep searching. So put links, you know, for the most part, don't put too many links, but enough links that, you know, if they're looking, they can just click, 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 because right. people scan copy online. Yeah. They don't necessarily read it. It's also a good way to kind of underscore what that area is about. You know, it, it really it's is. almost like bold facing it, but it gives it some, you know, import. Exactly. So exactly. Give people, you know, a reason to kind of continue surfing through your site. Okay, um, like we're we're going to go to the newsletter link here, um, and you'll see that there's nothing, um, there's the link to the actual newsletter, but there's nothing else here. Maybe some descriptive yeah, text? Yeah, some descriptive text. And that's another thing to think about when you're actually doing links is to think about the content. You know, say what you mean. Don't try to get too creative, but mm -hmm. assume that people coming to your site are coming for the first time. So get very descriptive. For instance, instead of saying front page like he does in the site, just say home page. Okay. I mean, don't try to get too creative. Everybody knows what a home page yeah. is. They might not know what the front page exactly. is. Exactly. And, you know, let imagine I'm what you I'm guilty of that. I get yeah. way too creative, and I know it's very confusing. It is very confusing. Here's yeah. another example. Oh. See, where we clicked Oops. on the staff link yeah. and it took us to a login area. So this is a chance where you click on the staff link, have another separate page, and say you need access, you need a username and password to log into this area. Right. If you don't have it, contact someone. Okay. You no, know, always give them the next step in right. the stages of linking. Right. And if they don't have that, say, you know, maybe visit our homepage to find out more about what events are coming up. And then a link if you're a member yeah. of staff, click here to yeah, continue. Yeah, keep on. them on your site, keep them moving around your Got site it. and as much as possible. Right. So that's one thing to really, really, really keep in mind. Yeah, so that you know, there's some linking basics. Um, you know, use plain language, uh, link a lot. My favorite thing, um, if you're going to do one link, do back to top. That's absolutely my favorite link. People forget about, and that would be used on a page. Like That's long. This. Yeah, it you looks. scroll all the way down. So all of I'm a sudden, lost now. I've scrolled yeah. all the way down. So all of a sudden, we get to the bottom of the page, and we don't know where to go because there's no navigation. So at the right bottom. at the bottom there, just back to yeah. top. Yeah. So blue links, underline, um, back to top on any page that scrolls and has no navigation right. on the bottom. Um, again, use plain language. Links are the heart and soul of the world they wide really web. They really are. You know, and people forget about them, and they just throw copy up there. But right. you know, try to get people moving around your site, and it's like directions and a roadmap. You know, right. you have to tell people where to go all the time. It's all about interactivity. Yeah. So. Thank you. Yeah, That's great. so we'll do a little bit more about linking in another segment. If but. you want to interact with Amber, send her your site for critiquing yeah. or uh, give her some ideas or some questions you want to ask. Definitely. Amber? Amber at callforhelptv.com. Callforhelptv.com. Yeah. Hey, let's take another call. Yeah, we have another caller. We have Christine from Montreal, Quebec on the line. All right. Let's nice. say hello to Christine as I stroll by. The lovely and talented Basil. Hello, Christine. How are you? Fine and you, Leo. I am so good, to, so glad to have you on the show. Me too. I've uh, discovered your show actually this summer, and I really enjoy it. Fabulous. A new viewer. Well, welcome. Yes. What can I do for you today? Well, Leo, uh, I've been struggling with this question for a, a while now, yeah. and uh, the question is simple. I'd like to know if there is a, a way to make an image or a backup of a whole, of a whole system right. 
so that if uh, something happens or uh, if I need to reinstall my system, that I won't have to go on uh, with the, the whole process of reinstalling the software one right. by one right. and tweaking uh, XP to um, right. my liking. We do that, Christine, right here. It's, it's a good thing to do if you want to get back up and running right away if that's urgent now of course on a TV show if one of our systems goes down we want to be able to put another hard drive in and restore it back to the way it was uh, so what we do is we create the system the way we want it we work on it we get it just the way we want it and then we do you use the right word we make an image of it and with the program we use and the program I would recommend is from uh, Symantec it's called Norton Ghost mm -hmm. and it, it the ghost is uh, is you're making a ghost of your machine it makes an exact perfect copy of the entire hard drive and this is exactly what I would recommend it's it's one part of a backup strategy remember the problem with it is it's a, it's a moment in time you've frozen a moment in time if you do a, even one little thing different now you're gonna lose that change so if you're working on a book or an article or a paper and you make some changes you still need to back that up separately but this will get you back to that kind of base installation where where you're ready to go and I think this is a very good program for that Okay, and if I change my hard drive, for example, and I, I uh, reinstall from the image from Ghost, uh, be, will it be exactly the same? Exactly the same. Oh, great! It's it, it's it's like dehydrating your uh, your your hard, your hard drive and and saving it. And you, what's nice about Ghost is uh, you can actually use it with a CD burner because most of the time the hard drive is so big it won't fit on a single CD. But you can actually use it with a CD burner and burn. I, I've burned seven, eight, nine, ten CDs to make one full image. So it's really good about that and understands how to do that and so forth. Highly wow. recommended. Yeah, I think you're going to like this. It's a, it's a really great program. There are other disk imaging programs, um, but this is the one I think pretty much everybody uses. Okay, great. Hey, thank uh, you. That, that's exactly what I need because uh, what I need is when, once every software is installed to make a, a, an image of that and then have uh, backups of my, um, my data. Perfect. That's exactly what I want to hear, because it doesn't replace the backing up of the data. So um, now that I know you're doing that, I'm comfortable with, uh, with recommending this. Great. Thank you for the call, Christine. Keep watching. Okay. Thank you very much, Leo. Okay. Au revoir. Bye. Bye-bye. Hey, if you have a personal confuser question you want to get on the show, we're going to tell you how you can do that and have some final words, too, right after this break. Stay right here. Welcome back to Call Forever. Are you handing out chocolates, Jenny? What do you got over here? Come on, man. Don't forget to check. <laughs> you can't come in the studio with chocolates and not share. Don't forget oh, to check man. out our contest online at callforhelptv.com. We've got some great prizes. Is this for Mr. Excel? Right. Oh, Mr. Excel sent us some chocolates. Some great oh, prizes man. on there. <laughs> Ladies and Jenny, gentlemen, Jenny Selly, if you, if you want to get on the show and you go to the website and you click that link, Jenny or Claudia are one of the two people who will call you and arrange to have you on the show, right? Yeah. So this is the nice person that you will meet. Oh. Jenny Sully, when you, uh, when you uh, call in. And thanks to Mr. Thanks, Excel. Hey, there's not nearly enough for all of us here. Oh, it's oh. money. It's money. Oh, all right. Oh, boy. Callforhelptv.com. That's the website. And uh, we're still looking for uh, sites for you, right? Yeah, if yeah. you have uh, sites to critique. Yeah, you can send them to me, Amber, at callforhelptv.com, and I'll take a look. Anything you would like uh, to tell people, Andy, in the last f faint, fading yeah, minutes you of the know, show? Yeah, I mean, you know how I do these, these how-tos. I want to know what you want to know how it works. Tell me, That's good. Know, Andy, it's uh, to call for help tv.com yeah tell me what you want to see so now i forgot it was billion is a, a gigabyte terabyte um, oh, now I've forgotten what, what the next one was. Exabyte. Ex, no, petabyte, petabyte, I think. Petabyte. Then exabyte. Exabyte. Then zettabyte. Then yottabyte. Mm. Yottabyte. And a yottabyte is, is septillion bytes. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, now we've all learned something. If you've got a problem, don't, don't whine, don't moan, don't yell at your poor old personal confuser. It doesn't need that. Just call for help. Me and Amber and Andy would be glad to help you. Have a great day. Take care. I wish I could send you some chocolates. I know. You want some? Here. <laughs> Yeah, here you go. Chocolates, here you go. Okay. Here you go. Okay, 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 okay. Hey, that's a chocolate.